interesting. So I have not had experience really doing passive or tumblers, but I feel like the information that you'll get from this will be able to translate and hopefully we can figure out what's going on with your compost if it's not working. So with that being said, who am I and why should you listen to me? <laughs> so um, I'm from Leesburg, Virginia now, um, and I have a background in exercise science, which has come in handy with moving all the compost and all the pitchfork um, <laughs> compost work that I've done and I have a background in public health. So um, to be able to serve my, commu my community in this way has been really fun um, and, and I love it. Um, and like I said, I've had no prior experience to composting except from what I've read from books and the internet. So, <laughs> but I've made, ooh, like 16 successful three by three by three foot um, batches of compost. And so I feel like I can consider myself a bit of an authority on it, um, <laughs> on the process because it has worked time and time again. Um, and so as Nikki said, I started a composting service for our area of Loudoun County because, you know, we moved from an area where we had a quarter acre and we composted. We just kind of threw greens back there and said, we're composting, it's working. Um, but then when we moved to our townhouse, um, you know, my husband and I had been talking about climate change and we got to do something. It's just so depressing. I was listening to a podcast for kids with my children in the car and they were saying, well, what's something you can do to help make the planet cooler? And they suggested composting. And I thought, great, I'm not going to compost in my townhouse. Maybe there's a service out there that will get my food scraps and compost it for me. And when I looked in our area, there was none. And um, I tried to work with our municipality to get them to, or see where they were on composting. And they're focused on recycling right now. So it was not something they wanted to do. So they said, pursue it from the private sectors. I said, okay, I'll try. Um, and thankfully, there are lots of composting services um, all over the US, a lot in the West, a lot in the Northeast but really nothing in Virginia, nothing in kind of the Midwest, except for Colorado, they're very robust there. Um, so anyway, I had a lot of models to go based off of, and I thought, okay, I can do this. <laughs> I can start this community-based composting service. And so I realized, okay, well, uh, I've never done this before, but I guess I'm gonna be the one composting, so I better learn quick. <laughs> so I got a very you know, intense crash course on how to compost. So what is compost? Most of you, I'm sure, have encountered it in your gardening. This is what you do. Um, it's that dark, earthy smelling material that's made from the decomposition of organic matter. Um, and composting is that deliberate act of doing it. And I only define this just because some people use food waste and compost interchangeably, and they're not. <laughs> Those are different things. <laughs> food waste is how we make it, right? Okay, and so I'm sure most of you have heard um, the two important components are your brown matter, your carbon, um, which can be wood chips, mulch leaves, sawdust, shredded newspaper, shredded paper, um, all kinds of things that have different levels of carbon in them. Um, I'll talk more about what I use and what I've found success with, but really with your brown matter, you want a diverse mix because they all have different levels of carbon. All of your green matter have different levels of nitrogen. So in order to get this compost to be robust and heated nicely and consistently, um, having a diverse um, makeup of your brown matter seems to be helpful. There are proper ratios that we will also address that I don't necessarily follow. Okay, and then uh, just real quick on green matter or your nitrogen, um, that includes food waste, grass clippings, garden trimmings, coffee grounds, and, and more, lots more, um, but just to give you an idea. So, okay, so we said brown matter, our leaves, for example, that's our little leaf chipper. Um, greens, examples, we see eggshells, apple cores, more eggshells, <laughs> lots of green matter, <laughs> lots of kale, um, all kinds of stuff. And then voila, compost, that's it, right? We just put those things together and it, that's it. Um, <laughs> uh, it's not quite that simple, um, but it is pretty simple. <laughs> so I think the more we understand how to make the compost works, then you guys are gonna be more successful with it. Because I know you've read what I read, which is like, okay, brown, brown green, done. Why isn't it doing anything? <laughs> Why isn't it getting hot, right? Okay, so the four components of composting are what we've already talked about, 
which is our carbon, right? And for me, I like to remember some adages. Also, when I'm on Instagram and I'm posting things, just funny things come out of my mouth like this. Um, and somebody asked this in the chat too. So the carbon for me is when you add brown to slow things down, right? Because your nitrogen is your greens and it keeps it mean, it keeps it hot. And so when we have an imbalance of our carbon and nitrogen, then we might see that our pile gets really hot really fast and then it dies. There's nothing else going on, right? And so that's a problem because that means that there's probably still food waste and other greens that haven't gotten decomposed yet. It got so hot, the microbes in there died, and then there's nothing else happening. So we need to have that nice ratio. It's supposed to be a three to one carbon to nitrogen ratio. Again, we'll talk more about that because I found success otherwise. And I don't, I just don't have time to be like, okay, let me measure my three, let me measure my one. Like there's just too much volume. So we move on. All right, another component of composting is air. So there are a couple different systems. There's the anaerobic system of composting where there's no oxygen involved. Um, and usually you don't want your compost to get into that because if it is anaerobic, then that's when it starts to get smelly and things are not happening. Um, it's not as hot. So we need the air to help the microbes breathe, right? And then we also need some water so that the microbes can move and digest. But really, the star of the show, which I kind of mentioned in these last two components, is the microbes. So our whole goal with composting is to make an environment where the microbes are happy and that they can do their thing. It's moist enough, it's warm enough, um, there's enough food, the nitrogen for it to be in. Um, and so, uh, for example, if your pile is right too dry, and your microbes can't move. And then if the pile's too wet, then they suffocate because the water is pushing out all of the air. Um, so we can talk in depth later, but the microbes are responsible for the compost breaking down. Um, and in case you wondered why compost gets hot anyway, it's their life cycle of eating and reproducing that makes it hot. So our goal is to keep the microbes happy. <laughs> all right. And so there are, you know, Roughly, we'll just say roughly, two ways of composting, right? We have our passive compost and our hot compost. Both rely on layering your brown and your green matter, right? And your passive compost is less work. There's no turning, you just pile. And then you let it sit and you let it wait. And if you're patient, then maybe you have a year before you have the finished compost. Um, it won't get hot, right, because it's passive. Um, you're just putting the microbes in a ideal situation so that things break down eventually. With the hot compost, it takes a little bit more work <laughs> and attention. Um, and with the Berkeley method, that the method that I use, um, it needs to be turned every two to three days. Um, for the volume that we do, I mean, it can take maybe half an hour or more, depending on how much. Um, but for most households, it won't take that long. But it does take time to be out there. But then again, to me, if you're a gardener, you're probably outside anyway. And <laughs> once you get into the habit of composting and see it working, then you'll be more motivated to go out there and like get excited for your compost to heat up and watch the changes happen. Um, so once that Berkeley method is complete, which takes about 18 days, we'll go into it. Um, after that, it rests for like two to five months and then voila, you're ready to go and you can use it in your garden which is a lot faster. So if you're impatient like me, then <laughs> hot composting is the way to go. Okay, so I do love this picture. How do we go from day one to day 15? Um, as I said, I do have a business, right? It's the compost, it's the food waste collection and then turning it into compost. So I was trying to take a picture of my, <laughs> of my piles and um, I was gonna take one picture and then another and then use an app to like put them next to each other and then I realized I have that already set up in the bins that are right next to each other. So I was just stunned because I happened to finish a pile, that's the day one, all the way up. And then I had a pile that was towards the end of that 18 day cycle at day 15. And I was just amazed <laughs> by the work of the microbes that that color is not, you know, there's no filter involved there. Like that is just the picture of how it looks. So anyway, how do we go from day one to day 15? Okay, 
So before you do anything, you kind of need to get your materials together, right? So um, as far as bins go, you don't have to do the three bin system like this. I've you know heard of plenty of people with success who've built their own things using large plastic containers that they've drilled lots of holes in, um, people with like hardware cloth or chicken wire bins that work well. Um, you know, try to use whatever you have. Um, this one we built, but we have another composting hub, as I call it, and it's built solely out of pallets that were reclaimed from, you know, the backs of warehouses. <laughs> pallets are, you know, not super easy to find, but you can find them. Um, and they, they're in good shape. Uh, and if you can find one in good condition, you might want to add hardware cloth around it, but um, it's definitely doable. So, uh, so there's that. I say that you want a cover, and I'll probably reiterate, reiterate this a couple of times, but um, the cover is not so much to keep the pile heated, or to help generate the heat. It's more, at least in my experience, the way I've used the cover is to keep water out. So uh, when it rains too much, then that pushes all the air out and it tends to drop the temperature really quick because the microbes are like, we're suffocating. There's nowhere for us to go. Um, but ideally, you will top your compost with a six inch layer of brown matter. Because if you've ever seen like a pile of leaves, um, if you get that first layer off, it's totally dry underneath. So brown matter on its own does a really good job covering, but if you just don't have that much on hand and you have a tarp anyway, then you can always use a tarp, like a cheap way to cover it. Um, there are some that have like actual lids. Um, let's see, what else? Brown matter we've talked about, green matter we've talked about, um, a pitchfork, just because I was a noob the first like month or two that I started this, I was using a shovel. A shovel takes way too long, <laughs> even though a pitchfork has holes in it and you wouldn't think it holds as much compost and food waste, it does. So please use a pitchfork, save yourself <laughs> some time and some energy and use a pitchfork. Okay. Um, a water source is recommended. However, I've never had to add water to it. Um, we'll talk more about the squeeze test, but it really depends on what kind of green matter you're putting in. Um, you know, if you've got drier things like uh, maybe grass clippings or, or something, something like that, um, then you might need to add water to it. But if you have things like pineapple tops or um, whole citrus or whole apples, you know, that the green matter on its own might have enough um, uh, liquid for you that you won't need to. But you can always, compost is very forgiving. So if you're in between flipping, and you're like, it looks dry, add water, done. Um, and then lastly, if you're a kind of a data nerd like myself, um, a temperature probe, because we're going to go into using your senses for how you can troubleshoot your compost. But having a temperature probe is really helpful. And it's really rewarding too. When you put your temperature probe in, you're like, yes, it's over 104 degrees or it's over 120 or whatever. Um, it's exciting to see that and to track that. Um, and it'll help you see, you know, exactly what's going on with your compost. Cool. Uh, Nikki, should I like check into the chat room? Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. So yeah, there are a few questions here. Thanks so much for checking in. Okay, um, sorry about and they that. They are great questions. They're mm -hmm. questions that I'd like to ask as well. So one okay. is, um, does animal excre excrement feet fit in anywhere? Um, you know, can you compost with cat and dog litter or poultry <laughs> or, yeah. You wanna... Gotcha, okay. Well, okay, so, it's generally not recommended to do that just because if you're not doing hot compost and it's not going successfully, then you're just introducing pathogens to your pile. Um, our piles stay pretty consistently above 130, um, but there are some, I mean, I'm not entirely sure what temperature pathogens die. I'm thinking of like food, right? When you, when you cook meat, you want it to be like over, what, 160? something like that. So whatever temperature that is, but it's like, how confident are you that your temperatures are going to stay that hot? Mm -hmm. So that's why generally it's not recommended to add um, those kinds of um, things. So we at Food Loop, we do a vegetarian pile just to keep everybody safe. And um, just in case my pile doesn't get as hot as it should, it usually does. But still, um, 
I would not, especially if you're first starting out, just to get the hang of it. Um, That's yeah. a good question. That's a good answer. Um, Julie asked if you have a bad ratio, uh, can you fix it by adding more browns? Yes. And can those browns be wood chip mulch from pine trees or pine needles, or is that too acidic? I, you know, I th I'm pretty sure that's what we have only used. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought. Yeah, you said. Yeah, at our composting hub, um, the gal whose property I'm on, they felled like six trees, and I'm pretty sure they were all pine trees because there are pine needles in it, and it's been fine. So um, I've had no trouble with it. Um, but yes, compost is very forgiving. Uh, there's time to fix it <laughs> as long as you know what to look for, and yeah, and you can add the right things. And flies in compost normal <laughs> that's what I thought too. it's normal it's okay I know it's a little shocking especially at the volume that we have when I pull the tarp open and it's like <laughs> lots of flies to greet me this one is great but okay. then that feels great. so good because yeah, I've been yeah. trying to prepare for this webinar I've been trying to compost every day I mean you know check it every day and I'm like ah flies but yeah okay. yes. good good I'll let Okay, cool. All right, so moving on. All right, now that we've got all of our materials, let's build the compost pile. Okay, so I'm sure you've heard, right, you layer your brown and your green. We've already discussed what the brown and the green are. Um, and I'm sure you've also heard of that three to one brown to green ratio. So that would be, and then from the browns, ideally you're doing a three to one ratio of wood chips, shredded leaves, sawdust. Confession, I have never done that before <laughs> because I never had all of those brown materials all at once. And I was like, I gotta get going on this compost thing. Let's just try and see. So um, the first thing that I had was shredded leaves because I, as I may have said, I started the business in like October, November. So lots of leaves, didn't really know about wood chips yet. Um, I was talking to another composter in Frederick, Maryland, and he said, you're gonna need some wood chips. It'll give it structural integrity. It'll help air flow better. Um, and you can easily get them because most arborists don't want <laughs> to have to take their wood chips to the landfills because it costs them money versus if they just drop a load at your house, everybody wins. Everyone's happy. Um, if you haven't heard of chip drop already, um, it is a free service where they connect you with an arborist who is getting rid of a load of chips. You can request wood chips. You can just request full size logs, that kind of thing. Um, you just tell them where you want it and then they'll arrange it. So pretty neat. Check it out if you um, are needing wood chips or you don't know a guy. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, ta -ta. so since I switched to wood chips, I've had a lot better success with the leaves. It kind of got too wet and um, it just, it didn't, it didn't work as well where the temperature also got too hot, too fast, and then it dropped really quick. Once I switched over to the wood chips that inherently had, you know, sawdusty size pieces um, and just different sizes in general, it's worked a lot better. Um, and I would say I have more of a one and a half to two to one ratio. So basically what I do is, I'm just gonna take a video, it's on my Instagram stories, but I have a layer of green matter and then I have enough layer of brown matter that I can't see any more green. So I know that's like very <laughs> subjective, but it has worked quite well. Um, and that's without having to measure exactly how much it is. Um, so I'm just, I'm just telling you the truth. I just eyeball it. Um, and there was someone else who asked about adding soil or mulch. And I think the idea behind that is it's just another way of adding brown matter to the mix. Or maybe the thought is the soil or the mulch already has some of those microbes in them. And so that would help the process go faster. Um, so I, I think it's fine if you add soil or mulch. Um, but you would just want to make sure that you, again, have that good ratio. So if you're noticing, like I said before, if your pile is not heating up, it's probably that you have um, too few greens. You need more greens. Um, yeah. And then if your pile heats up too fast and then all of a sudden it tanks, then it's probably you don't have enough brown to kind of sustain the um, decomposition. So um, important to have lots of brown on hand just because again you can you usually want to have more of that than your green and also to have that six inch topper whenever you close your pile and like I said before the six inch of brown matter 
is to keep rain out, but it's also to um, keep, oh my gosh, what else? I had a reason. Never mind. Can't remember. Okay. <laughs> Maybe the temperature, right? But yeah, um, it's good to have that layer on top. Um, it kind of like insulates the pile. Yeah. But it's like really choppy. Sorry, can you say that again? Or comment it? My connection was unstable. I don't know if you can hear. I but can hear I, you now. Oops. Yes, I think um, the six inch topper might also help insulate, especially there was a question for somebody composting in Minnesota. How can you compost in the winter, which you have successfully done? Like it's super freezing outside and yet your, your temps are 130 in the yeah. pile. And um, I know that, that that six inch topper probably helps with that insulation, covering it in tarp and turning it every other as you will explain. Yeah, no, it does help. Um, and I was, uh, <laughs> the Instagram community, I don't know if you guys are on Instagram, but it's very robust with gardeners. And one of my, my now friends uh, was in Minnesota and we were talking about his compost and he was complaining because he couldn't get it to heat up and blaming the cold for it. And I said, check it out, buddy. I have freezing temperatures too. And it's not, you know, we're not having the same problem. So then we realized that his problem was he didn't have enough greens, which might be the problem that you will run into um, as you guys are more home composters. Um, so that's why piling your greens in kind of a big chunk of first, like I have a carrot. This will heat up my pile. <laughs> we need a little bit more than that. So if you can, you know, hold on to your greens as much as you can. Um, get coffee grounds from the local Starbucks or wherever you can. Um, it just seems to work better and it has seemed to work better for other Instagrammers who are, you know, doing their hot compost in their garden and not finding those hot temperatures. Okay. So more on greens because there might be more greens than you thought that you could add to your pile. So here is a list and I included some things that people had asked specifically about. Um, so things that are okay to compost are any and all vegetable and fruit parts. Somebody asked about moldy banana peels. Totally fine. Um, uh, literally any part of a vegetable. The ones that I have found are that take a little bit longer are onions, uh, squash, squash and gourds. They refuse to be composted. Uh, it takes several passes for those to go, especially if you're not chopping them up into like the one and a half to two inch size pieces, um, which sometimes I don't because we do so many passes of compost that I just like, I, I don't have time to chop all of these things up. Um, but really any vegetable fruit part. And then if you're concerned about seeds, if you're hot composting hot enough, most seeds will die. I know that um, tomato plants, I think they need like 160 degrees for several days for them to die, but everything else pretty much dies. Um, again, moldy food, that's fine. They're already decomposing in one way. I've added moldy food plenty of times and it just disappears. I have no trace of it. Um, citrus peels, are fine. Um, the same with brown matter in that you don't want to have only citrus peels. Um, uh, it just is, they're in general harder to decompose. They just take a little bit longer, but you can do it. Um, I've had citrus peels from like bakeries where they have like the peels in nice little slices. And then I've had people who just have whole clementines and oranges that they got rid of for some reason and eventually, eventually, they do break down. Um, avocado pits are fine. I posted recently because I discovered this. I was picking up an avocado pit and just for fun, I squeezed it and it crushed into lots of little pieces. So as tough as an avocado pit is, um, if it's sitting in your compost long enough, it will decompose, it will be squishy, and then you can break it down with your hand. Same with apples. Very rewarding to squish something like that. Um, coffee grounds, also good. Um, I've heard, I've read questions about the amount of caffeine that's in coffee and is that going to ruin your garden on the back end? If you're hot composting well, or even if you're composting well, um, the caffeine gets broken down enough that it's insignificant by the time it gets to your garden. So you're safe there. Eggshells are ones that take 
a bit longer, but um, they do break down. It takes a couple passes. And by passes, I mean like a whole 18 day of the hot composting cycle for them to break down. But then again, you know, when we garden our tomatoes and they need calcium, we usually just break down eggshells and put them in. So to me, I feel like it's okay if eggshells are in there because most, I mean, our plants at least needed the extra calcium. You can always filter those out if you decide to go that route. We'll talk about it. Okay. And then I put a compostable bags question. Oh, somebody asked about garlic. Garlic's okay too. Um, somebody asked about compostable bags and I put a question mark because not all compostable bags are created equally. Some of them are, some of them just break down into smaller kinds of plastic. Um, like they will break down, but it's just microplastics. Um, and then some of them actually are made from like plant fibers. And so, you know, it might take longer than it says it will, but it will break down. Um, so just try and look at those, the, if you can, um, what the compostable bags are made out of. Um, some of my clients have asked me about like the paper, like cardboard, like um, compostable items, and most of them do break down. It just it's they're really tough actually. So once they've been in the compost for a while, then you can kind of rip them and shred them apart into smaller pieces, and then they disappear. Um, so that is it on the green. With any questions that came up with the green, from my um, one question, I thought that it was good to ask. If you want an organic garden, do you have to compost only organic produce? I had that question as well because <laughs> somebody asked me about it. I was trying to use a community farm that did organic compost and they said, well, we only accept organic material for it to be organic. Then I met a farmer and he said, I'm trying to get certified organic. And I said, well, like, are all of your crops organic? And I asked him the same question. He said, I don't think it matters. So my answer is, I don't know, <laughs> but that I've heard conflicting answers on that. So I guess you, we'd have to ask kind of the authority. Yeah. Um, I've heard, it. yeah, I've heard Jeff Lawton, um, and I can't find this video anymore, but he made one where uh, he had like, if you look at all the carbon chains, um, and this is something I just mentioned in a, in to, to Tanisha last night, the, the solution to pollution is dilution. And so when you are overwhelmed with all the goodness of that, the carbon that's breaking down in your compost pile, if there are... Um, heavy metals or uh, poisons that are insignificant, like they become more insignificant because they are trapped in the long carbon chains that are produced in the in the composting process. So this is something from Jeff Lawton that that I learned. But um, yeah, if there's an overwhelming amount of the pesticides, I'm sure that that might overwhelm you know your compost. So if it's like you just happen to have like a little introduction of like hay that was all sprayed down and then the rest of the stuff is good organic matter or just you know not significant i think in the process the microbes also digest and can process these chemicals the fungi especially can process the, the chemicals poisons or whatnot into something that's organic again so camille i think after three months in some cases dave maybe you can speak to this too the um, the, pest, the pesticides or whatnot um, go away in a composting hot bin of hot composting. Dave, what do you know about this? Um, yeah, mostly, I, I, I don't know specifically about what happens during the hot compost process, but when it gets up to the 170, it's essentially like a slow bake kind of thing for, for a number of days. So uh, I, all the the pathogenic stuff you, you probably don't have to worry about. And then um, some of these like heavy metals you, you might have to, to worry about, but and I think it depends on the, the type of pesticide that might be in it. There's some that doesn't break down as easily as others, but uh, yeah, I think it's like a mixed bag. If you just have a little bit, I don't think it's a big issue, but if, it, if there's, if, it's comprising most of the materials in your compost. That's when it becomes an issue. Thank you. <laughs> Again, my lane for what I know is very specific. So 
I think I've been like going full steam with like the actual doing that I haven't had time to research outside. So thank you guys for that. Um, and as you can see on the red box is the not okay to compost. Um, and like we touched on before, um, Part of it is introducing potential pathogens or inviting critters, or simply it just slows the compost down. So, you know, I think just because I knew that it was going into the hot compost pile and I wanted to see, I think I had macaroni and cheese and my kids didn't finish. And I put that in the pile because I knew it was like a small amount of dairy and a small amount of butter that was gonna be put in the pile and they disappeared. Um, but for the most part, you just avoid dairy, fats and oils at all costs. Um, again, the meat and the bones, inviting potential pathogens and kill it and critters and so um and same with like whole eggs eggshells are fine the inside part ugh, gets a little messy right um and so since the piles get very hot though um most pathogens including covid because i went i listened to a webinar about that um get killed but if you don't do it correctly you could instead create that perfect environment for all these pathogens to proliferate so especially if you're just starting out best to keep them out of your compost. Okay, more on that. All right, so continuing with our how to hog compost, adding to the pile. So the goal, at least to do the Berkeley method, is to get to three by three by three feet. Like one cubic yard is your goal for your pile. Um, and so if you're not quite there, it's okay, no worries. Um, I had one of my piles today that was starting to, that is building. It's about a foot high and it was already steamy, hot, white, um, <laughs> white matter all over the place. That's their actinus, actinus, I think I'm saying that right, maybe not. But um, it's just another sign of your um, thermophilic bacteria and like fungi working. So even if your pile is not that tall, you can still heat it up. Um, and it will just continue to stay hot the more you keep adding the greens and the browns to it. Um, so anyway, once you have added your initial um, layers of your pile, your brown, green, brown, green, make sure you always finish with brown. Always start with brown, always end with brown. Um, you just let your pile sit for like four to five days and you will, when you go back to visit it, your pile should be warm. That's always how it's happened for me and it's very exciting because you're like why should I touch the temperature it's so short anyway oh my gosh it's really warm it's working um, so yes so once you get to that point um, and you're ready to you've got a nice little pile of greens going um, maybe enough to cover the layer that could take maybe a couple weeks to get um, I know so sorry so with our clients we pick up their food scraps every week or every two weeks. And it takes maybe two buckets to cover one layer. So if like you and another family and you were like, just give me your food scraps, okay? Or if you have like your family's food scraps plus like grass clippings or something, that could, that's probably enough to add one layer. Yay. So if that's the case and you're ready to add, then you're gonna do what it says in step C. Okay, so you're gonna start if you have like two bins going, right, then you're gonna layer brown, your new green, and then your existing pile on top of it. And then if there's no more green to add, then just keep doing your existing pile, fluff it out. As you're flipping it, you're gonna take a little bit of your pitchfork and you're gonna kind of shake it or literally flip it over into the pile. That way you add air into it. You are also trying to, mix up the order of your pile in that you're trying to move the hot hot in the middle towards the outside and then the outside of the pile you kind of move more towards the middle when you get fatigued of doing it you end up just flipping it and adding air as you go and it's fine it works out so there are specific ways of doing it and there's also just like the i'm just going to flip it and move it the microbes are happy. And the reason, again, why we're flipping the pile so much so often is to really help those microbes travel, right? Because they're so tiny, they can only get so far. And so you're trying to distribute the microbes throughout the pile evenly. Um, again, you're still trying to incorporate more air into it. And when you visit your pile, you can start to troubleshoot it and see, did my pile even get hot? Does it look dry? Do I need to add maybe a sprinkle of water? Um, you know, is it looking yeah, is it looking too wet? Do I need to fluff it out some more? Do I need to add some more brown matter to it to kind of soak up the um, liquid? That kind of stuff. Um, 
And again, yeah, uh, yeah. And most important is that you don't want to just say like, okay, here's my pile. It's like a foot high, it's super warm. I'm just gonna dump my greens on top, a layer of brown and call it good. We really need to get in there and flip it. That way you're incorporating the air um, and saying hi to all those little microbes. And again, layer the pile with that brown matter on top. Okay, so once you've done all of that, I've already kind of <laughs> talked about flipping the pile. Um, again, adding air, distributing the microbes. I'm gonna repeat it again and again because I feel like the flipping the pile part is where most people lose interest. <laughs> and they're like, this is hard, I can't. <laughs> and then they're like, my pile didn't do anything, I don't know why. And it's probably because it wasn't being flipped enough. Um, so to do the 18 day Berkeley method, um, you are going to start your day one when the pile is three by three by three tall. So like as tall as that picture right here, because each of these boards is six inches. So that's our full, full pile. Okay, so you're gonna start that as day one when your pile is full. Then you're just gonna let it be hot, let those microbes get to know each other, let things get nice and steamy, they're gonna reproduce, it's gonna get hot, and then day four comes and you'll flip the pile. And so flipping the pile, like I said, um, you're going from top to bottom, you're trying to do the inside where you'll see that nice white hot steamy core to the outside of the pile, and then um, the outside of the pile again towards the inside. So once day four happens, then you're gonna flip it on day six, day eight, day 10 until you get to 18. If you miss a day, it's okay. <laughs> like three days is acceptable. I've even, I think I pushed it once to like four or five days and the compost was like, oh, hey, nice to see you again. Thank you for flipping me. <laughs> We're still hot, but it would have been nice to see you earlier. <laughs> the temperature did go down a teensy bit. And then when I flipped it, the next time I measured, the temperature went back up. Surprise, surprise. Um, so it's okay to miss a day, two to three days. Is acceptable. Um, however, if one of those days, or if you're at like, you skip day two, you're like lazy on day three, or like it starts to rain on day three, it would be better for you to wait till the rain stops, if it's like super heavy, that way you're not introducing more water into the pile than you need to. So just kind of look at the weather. If there's a break in the weather, that's like your chance to get like your really intense 30 minute cardio <laughs> to like flip the pile. Um, just because, like I said, we don't want to introduce too much water because um, the temperature will tank if you do that. Um, and I know it probably sounds like, gosh, this is a lot of work for those 18 days, but it is so rewarding and enjoyable to look at the pile, to see the difference, to smell the difference, and to know like, oh my gosh, this is actually getting somewhere. <laughs> um, like those two and a half weeks, I'm going to have something beautiful by the end of it. So I promise it is worth it. Um, uh, someone had asked earlier about um, worms in the pile, and I'd say flipping the pile is important even if you have worms. Um, one being that the worms can only travel so far, they can only do so much, um, so it'll at least help them get to a different part of the pile. Um, and another follow-up question was about the temperature, and I was researching and that there are, there's a lot of different um, opinions on what temperature um, will kill worms, um, but I, I haven't really paid too much attention because it seems like the worms know where it's too hot for them. Like I said, the inside of the pile is where you'll find the most heat, and so then the worms will kind of shift to the outside of the pile naturally, um, and then they'll you know, continue doing their thing, trying to stay away from getting too hot too fast. Um, something else that you'll observe, we're gonna talk more about observations while you're flipping your compost, um, is you'll notice the volume of your pile decreasing. So like I'm showing in this picture, right? Like, so this is the bin totally full, but by the time I came to it, it may have like dropped down six inches. And that's just because the air has, you know, rushed out of it, things are settling. So again, that's why it's important to make sure you're flipping your pile so that you can bring the air back into it um, and fluff it up again. So sometimes when my pile goes down by like six inches or more, when I flip it, it's all of a sudden back up to the top. <laughs> so it just goes to show how much, how important it is to get all that air into it. So, cool. Any new questions? <laughs> yes, there were some. Uh, can you flip? You can you speak to anybody who's trying to do composting in the desert, Lauren, or in higher temperatures? 
sure it's would, already would you know hot? anybody yes do, do you know of anybody who does hot composting in the desert uh you know okay so i think i was going to save it towards the end but there is okay. a group called the institute you probably have heard of it the institute of local self-reliance oh okay all right i type that down and one of their um my God, initiatives is composting. And there's this lovely map of all the composters um, who are community composters like myself. Um, we just have like some other small scale or, or like a food waste collection service, that kind of stuff. And I mean, the map is pretty full on the West. I know somebody's from Arizona. Um, <laughs> so I'd probably say you can compost. The only trouble might be that your pile might evaporate too quickly and you might be the kind of person that needs to add water to the pile but um yeah everything else should probably would probably be about the same so just, can we uh continue to add um to our pile once we once it's three foot tall um i think you can it's just going to be more work for you to flip it <laughs> but like with this method you don't really have to add more i've done bigger piles um but then once the pile gets too big so okay sorry so i have like two different compost hub situations one is the the lovely neat square bins that i have and then the other one is just these open piles um because that place where we're composting has a lot more space. I'll show you, I'll show you a picture in a second. Um, but I've noticed, I guess I might not, I'm just not a good pile builder, <laughs> but I've noticed that the um, temperature is much more inconsistent when it's the big open piles. Um, and so if you're doing that, that could be an issue. Um, but yeah, but otherwise it should be okay. I may have forgotten what the question was. Um, thank you. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. We'll, 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 we'll still have a Q&A, guys, so don't worry. Okay. <laughs> All right. we'll send, I'll, I'll try to, um, we'll try to have the replay out by tomorrow. So some of you may have asked questions here in the end, and we have answered them earlier, such as the one about chemicals. Isabel, I see you. Um, and we did talk about chemicals in the pile and chickens as well. Um, but yes, we'll talk about that. Maybe we can reiterate later on, Lauren, or um, well, you'll see that in the replay for sure. Okay, cool. Um, all right. So um, now that we've been adding to the pile, we've been flipping to the flipping the pile. You want to know is it working? Is is anything really happening? Because after the first week, um, you know, day five, day seven, you're still like. This smells funky still. <laughs> like this still smells kind of like rotting food. I can still see a lot of whole pieces. Is anything even happening? Um, and uh, we can continue to use our senses and be delighted to see that the compost is actually working. Um, and so uh, since we're human, I recommend keeping track of these things, especially if it's like your first time and you're not really sure. I still like to keep note of at least the temperature so that I can see like that there's a nice progression happening. So for example, um, using our senses. So looking at this picture over here, we notice that there's a color change, right? So the outside of the pile is our wood chips, right? It looks pretty dry. And then this is just like taking that first layer off um, and moving it, excuse me. And we can already see that towards the center of the pile, it's starting to get dark brown. I cannot remember what day this is on, but it's probably in that first week or maybe day seven, 11, somewhere in there. Um, but you can also already see that it's starting to change color. And then the inside of the pile, we see all this white. And like I was saying, the white is an indication of that really hot thermophilic bacteria um, and the actinomites um, that kind of hot fungi that's working um, and so that's how we know something is changing <laughs> and then smell wise we can smell the smell is kind of shifting over um, and so then yeah so that's what kind of what we can notice and then temperature wise um, this is just an example of how I've done it uh, I start as the more that I composted I didn't so much do you know, what it smells like, what it feels like, because I kind of got the hang of it. But those are other things that you can also keep track of. It's also just exciting when you do it. Okay, so the gray is the pile building. 
So it took a couple, you know, it took like two weeks for the pile to get to that three by three by three size. Um, but right away, you can see on day three of the pile building, it was already at 155 degrees. Like what? That's really crazy. Oh wait, can you see this screen? Like the picture of you guys? Oh, that's funny. Oh. Sorry, I should have like. Oh hit. no, we don't. We don't see that the picture that. Oh okay, of like everybody, of like all of your faces. Okay, just because I was like, shoot, I'm blocking it. Okay, sorry. So um, already day three, 155 degrees. What? And then I uh, I added more to it, and it stayed hot. And I added more to it, and it kept staying hot. And then finally, day one started February eighth. And the pile was at 147. I was kind of discouraged because I was like, oh my gosh, the temperature was so hot and now it's decreasing. What's going on? Um, waited four days and temperature went down a teensy bit, flipped it, gave it some love. See, I was lazy. Look how many days are in between that, four and eight, right? So it was like four days later, I came back and I flipped it. And then something happened and me flipping it more often kept that temperature hot. <laughs> and then as we go along, um, we noted at day 18, we're still hot, 140. And then by day 23, as you would expect, the temperature is decreasing and it decreases more. And at that point, what we're looking for is kind of a more consistent pile. So instead of getting the hot middle and then getting you know drier as we go out, you're looking more at like, wow, this pile is nice and dark brown the whole way through. Um, there's kind of white all over the place. I don't see any more of those big pieces of brown matter. I can't tell that there was green onions and bell peppers and carrots and grapes and all that other stuff that was in the pile. That's what we're looking at. Um, and then this picture is just a fun one of my son, who both of my kids get dragged outside frequently to do compost with me because it's outside and they don't want to be there. But <laughs> this particular day, it was like rainy and cold and um, my son wanted to warm up and the pile was like 130 some degrees. So I wrapped him in a towel and I sat him in there and he almost took a nap because <laughs> he was just so comfy. So um just, just more proof that the piles do get hot and they stay hot, even if they're open, even if it's like 30 some degrees outside. So maybe it wasn't that cold, but still. All right. So again, more things that we notice. Um, this is a finished pile <laughs> towards day 15, day 18, that nice dark, dark color. And then this one where you can still see some grass sticking out of it. You can probably see some celery, some squash over here. Um, this is a pile that's building. So right away we can see that there's a difference. There's a darkening in the color over time. I did not add any fun filters to this picture. <laughs> this is just what it looks like. Um, right away you'll notice the smell is different between the two. Um, I was working in one of the hot piles or one of the finished piles and I just got used to that like soil smell in my nose and then one of my volunteers pulled open the other one that was that was building I was like, what is that smell oh my gosh it's the combos I mean it doesn't smell bad it just smells like rotting food um so it's just neat to see the difference okay Something else I mentioned, moisture, um, and I talked about it really briefly earlier, is the squeeze test. So if ever you're like, mm, not really sure how wet this is supposed to be, do the squeeze test. So you grab a handful of your compost and you squeeze it. And you're looking for it to feel moist, but you don't want more than a couple drops dripping out. I've done it before and I haven't had really any drops drip out. Um, maybe that first or second batch that I made with the mulch leaves, that one I got some, and it felt like really squishy to squeeze. Um, so that is the squeeze test. That's how you know if it's too wet. So again, you want it moist, but not dripping. And then again, temperature um, for hot composting should be between 130 and 160. So that's not to say, and I'm going to show you a graph later. It's not to say that compost activity isn't happening outside of that temperature, lower than that temperature, but that's when you're like, okay, we're really cooking. We're using that thermophilic bacteria. Uh, there's an upper limit to compost just because if it gets too hot, then the microbes die. Um, and if that's the case, then what does that mean? It means that there's too much green and not enough brown in your pile, right? Because the green keeps it mean. So if it's too hot, then it's too much green. Cool, we want brown to slow things down. Um, and then this one is a picture of compost from 
I want to say it's like day one, day 12, and like day 19. So you can see that slow progression of the color changing. I was very tempted to like change the filter on this so it's like, see how dark it is, but you gotta be truthful. Um, <laughs> there is a shift. And you know, maybe the iPhone camera is not as great as capturing the contrast as I was seeing it when I looked at my pile to take the picture, but you get the idea, I think. Okay. So next up, temperature stages of composting. Like I said, um, you know, 130 to 160 is generally where you consider hot compost, but as we can see from here, um, we've got the mesophilic stage of composting where things are starting to happen. Excuse me. There is certain bacteria that are active during this time, woohoo. And then once we get to over 104, then you start to get the thermophilic bacteria and the actinin oh, actinomycetes. I've been saying that so wrong this whole time, but that's the white stuff that you see in the pile in that picture. Um, and that's like when it's super active. As you can see, like during the timeline, of days happening, it's like between day three and like close to 18, right? And so then once the temperature starts to go back down below 104, there's still composting stuff going on. It's just not as quick and not as much breakdown, right? So this is a fun one. Uh oh, sorry. <laughs> ah! That is loud. Okay, cool. That's fun in case you're wondering like, why does the temperature matter? What's happening? Why is it getting hot? Why is it not? So there you go. Okay. Ah, so again, troubleshooting your pile. So you've kind of talked about this throughout and figuring out what's going on, what could be wrong with my pile. Um, so a lot of people have asked <laughs> me, like in general when I'm at the farmer's market, my compost smells bad. Um, and it's probably because there's just not enough green or there's not enough air happening. Um, and so you would need to add more of your brown matter and again, turn your pile. <laughs> if your pile is too dry in the center, then there's probably not enough water. And again, you need to moisten and turn the pile. A lot of it is turning the pile, right? Um, Right, and if there's not enough volume to your pile, then that could also be why it's not heating up. Um, so again, like kind of stockpiling your greens um, would be a good thing to do. Um, and, and sometimes like, if you've had like a failed batch, which I've had before, um, instead of screening it or just letting time take over, I was just like, you know what, let's just use this as the base to my new pile. So if you're like, okay, I'm gonna start composting, I have a pile that was like in the tumbler and it was horrible, don't knock it. Like you could probably use that as kind of the incubator for your pile. So you would just pretend that that's your existing compost matter. I mean, it is your existing matter, right? So then you'll do brown, green, that old stuff. And it does, jumpstart the pile because all that all those microbes are like hey we've done this before sort of so we, are, we can do it um so that's a good way to use your old stuff um yeah and then like i've said before if your pile is wet but it's still not getting hot it's probably because you don't have enough greens um so try to find greens wherever you can other people coffee grounds grass clippings all that jet And then the last step to the compost is resting and testing your pile. Um, so it will take a while, as you saw in that graph, for your temperature to go down. Um, but that's good because that means that there's still composting activity happening. Um, but it also means that you probably shouldn't use it right away because that means that there's probably nitrogen still present, right? and your compost, is, your carbon stuff is still very active. Um, and so we want it to rest until it gets to the point where the temperature doesn't increase when it's flipped. So that's how you know for sure compost is ready to be to mature and I can use it. Um, and you can definitely let it rest longer. Again, use your senses. Um, if you still see whole pieces of food or the color hasn't deepened or you put your face to it and you're like this smells like food still or it smells like something <laughs> it doesn't smell like soil then it's probably not ready um, there are a couple tests that you can do um, one is putting a small amount into a ziploc bag closing it 
and then you open it really quick, smell, and then close it again. And if it smells like not soil, then it probably needs more time. <laughs> I, I say by not soil because you'll just know. You're like, something is not right here. This doesn't smell like something that I would just find in my garden already. Um, so yeah, just give it more time. Um, and then as you can see in my picture, um, I have built this screener. So it's literally just hardware cloth. That's a half an inch. Um, and we made this little wooden frame and stapled it to it. Voila. And I made it so that it's the size of my wheelbarrow so I can just screen right away into it. Um, it's sort of just for aesthetics, but it's also to take out the larger pieces of um, brown matter because those will eat up the nitrogen that's in your soil. And you want the nitrogen that's in your soil so that your plants can use it, right? So we want to filter that stuff out. Um, and then there, I'm sure Nikki could speak more of all the ways that you can use compost, um, but you can add the finished compost to the top, the, like the two to four inches on top, or you can mix it with the six to eight inches of topsoil in your garden. You can also use it as mulch on top. Lauren, so just to be clear, I thought that we could use the uh, compost at day 18, but you're saying that it's best to leave it and rest it first. Yes. Yeah. What do you find the compost looks like at day 18 for you? At day 18, it it's looks... It's too hot. What? Oh, it's too Is hot. Is it still hot? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so that happened the other day, um, and it was at day, I think, 19. And the temperature was reading at like 130 still. <laughs> so, <Wow>. yeah. <laughs> so I've had some piles where like, it's just not done yet after the 18 days, which I guess could mean that I could, should put more brown to it so that it goes faster through the process. But then again, I, there was like this one time when I made a pile and it went too fast and it didn't smell right. So it's kind of like everything has to be aligned right mm -hmm. so like maybe the temperature is still was still warm but uh -huh. like smell wise it smelled like compost <laughs> it smelled or, like smell. or maybe like your arc your um your my curves like my that. curve came like on day four or started at day four and so like yeah. day 18 to you, you might have just like the curve was a little a little skewed because of whatever variables yeah, yeah. that there could have been yeah. Okay, so that's good to know. So it's still four weeks after day 18, just to be safe yeah. and to make sure that other processes. Thanks so much. Um, there are a few things like, can you help us visualize or maybe can, I don't know if we can share a video of you in the process of composting. Do you compost within the bin or do you turn it to another bin? You have a three bin system, right? Yeah, yeah. So I always turn it into another bin. One time I tried just like, I was, I don't know, I was feeling not lazy, but it just, I was like, let me just try something new. And so I tried <laughs> to turn the pile in the pile and yes. it just, I just ran out of space and I was like, I'm losing track of what was on top and what was on bottom. Um, cause I know like I've seen the new, you guys have like a little aerator, right? Yeah. yeah. But we don't, but we don't get it that hot because of, we used to have a two bin, but we needed to like, Put the rain barrel jack did the rain barrel yeah, <laughs> so we like okay made it a one bin so now we have nowhere to put the compost to like flip I mean, it to the other side yeah i've seen it where like if the front can come off you could even lay out a tarp uh -huh. and like, rake the whole thing out and then put it back in oh so that would be a different way if you didn't have like two situations, that's why it's, it's good to have a lot of space because, or I mean enough space that you could at least remove all the things. Yeah. Yeah. That would work for sure. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Just thinking Thank about you. it. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. So, so that could work for you guys. Anything else? Okay. Uh, okay. So we're ready. That's it done no <laughs> so i'm sure there are probably more questions yes there are um, so many questions i've collected okay. this um so i think you've answered a lot of the ones that came through email right lauren was there anyone yes. that you didn't answer i don't think so okay so oh another question is about the critters how do you keep from attracting critters does it really matter <laughs> okay because you're so, out in the woods right right so the critter thing it's interesting. I have only had critters in my mature piles. 
And I think, so like the ones that are building never have had it. Um, it's just uncomfortably hot. It's like 130 degrees. Like I wouldn't want to be. In there. Yeah. <laughs> so there's never been any critters in like the active hot piles. Um, I've had critters in the mature piles or the piles that are, um, are, uh, yeah, curing. That's the word because you know, it's like a balmy 70, 80, 90 degrees in there. Um, and so, I mean, the only thing I've read is how to keep them out is to just make sure you're visiting those piles, which would be another thing to like flip those maturing piles just to also test to see is the temperature increasing when I flip it or is it staying consistent? So, um, yeah, but that's only at one of the properties. Maybe the other one they don't because they have dogs and the dogs just like, would scare the mice. I don't know. Um, but that's the only like critter situation I've had is in okay. the mature pile. So if you, if you can't, cause that mature pile is also just like out in the open, but I feel like if you have a bin or a specific place with a lid, that would be fine. Um, like a lid with, you know, holes drilled on the side so it can still breathe. That would be a, a better, a better situation for your curing compost. Awesome. Uh, is there any risk of fire at these high temperatures? Perhaps if moisture is not kept ideal. I feel like I've read that, but I've, I mean, I've never encountered that. And like, I've touched the pile and it's like a hundred, like it's been 160 degrees before where I'm like, is my tarp going to be okay? Um, <laughs> but I, I've never had a fire. It never smelled like fire. It was always just like smoky. So, I mean, I think theoretically it's possible, but I haven't gotten there. So just again, more testament to checking in on your pile and seeing if it is moist enough. Um, and, um, and then if, uh, can you use cooked vegetables like leftover steamed broccoli or veggies that were cooked in oil? So yeah, good question. Um, if it's steamed and there isn't oil in it, then I'd probably say you can go for it because it's already on the way to decomposing anyway, right? <laughs> like it's, it's already started to break down from what it was. Um, with the oil, I've had somebody ask me before and I was like, okay, well, if you're the only one, then like, let's try it. Like I said, I think I had my kids mac and cheese and it had obviously cheese on it. Um, and it broke down fine. So I, it, the only risk with adding things that have oil in it is that it can slow the pile down. It just makes it harder, I guess, for the microbes to decompose, to um, break it down. So as long as you have like a nice diverse mix and you have like one batch of that, you should be okay. Somebody asked me about salad dressing on a salad too. Same, mm -hmm. same kind of deal. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. then um, if I'm planning, somebody's planning to use a plastic container and drill holes, um, do you recommend using the lid? I guess this would be like a big sterilite container, if that's what she means, and then drill holes. That seems to be more like something I do for a worm bin, and I, I do use the lid for that. But do yeah. you recommend hot composting in a plastic container? I mean, I, I can't say that I've done it, so I don't know. But I mean, there, the internet is full of people who <laughs> have done things uh, like that. And um, so I feel like if... Yeah, I think it's possible. I don't see why not. The only thing that I guess would get to me maybe is like if the temperature got so hot, the plastic melted, but it takes a pretty high temperature to get plastic to melt. So um, I'd say you're probably okay if you use the plastic one and just, it just make sure that you have enough holes in it. Um, Cause a friend of mine was doing the same thing and he was showing me a picture of the compost and it wasn't really breaking down. Um, and he was saying there was a lot of flies and like other bugs and not much going on and it wasn't getting hot or yeah. Yeah. Cause it, yeah, I think he just said it had a, a funky smell. And so it looked like he just didn't have enough Browns and it didn't look like it had enough holes. So just make sure it's, it's quite holy, quite ventilated. Um, and somebody had trouble visualizing it. Do you have uh, right now a story that of you turning the compost by any chance or uh, do I see you? Yeah, I'm pretty sure on Instagram. Okay. I think I'll I'll see, maybe I can, I don't know if you'll see the, I'll see if I can share it. It's probably not of me physically composting because like oh, it's really you can't. me and my phone that I prop up somewhere. <laughs> but like, uh, let's see, a hard time visualizing. Well, okay, so we have that, hold on, there's that one picture. Uh, oh, no, no, no. Okay. So that's me. Um, those are the bins. I think I'm going from this pile that has only the three boards over to the, oh, no, no, no. I'm sorry. I'm going from the middle one over to the one that's shorter. So like literally, I just 
take a layer off <laughs> and then I turn my hand and like flip it so that um, whatever was on the top now goes to the bottom. And then like, as I'm flipping it, I kind of try to sh 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 shake it so that there's air coming into it. <laughs> That's literally all I can say. Um, is it that yeah. kind of thin situation? <laughs> I wonder. Yes. Yes, now, now she says she can uh, and understand it a bit. Um, <laughs> just, thank you. Sounds like yeah. <laughs> well, did you want to, these are awesome questions, but it is 9.07. I just wanted to, rep uh, to respect everybody's time. Um, Jody, how long does it usually take for a flip session? Like it gets shorter and shorter for me, right? But about for you, how does it, how many minutes? Uh, okay, so today I had like a full bin that I was flipping and I think it took me, I think the fastest I've done it is like 22 minutes. But I'm also like pregnant and short, and so <laughs> I don't have much going for me as far as like getting into the pile and flipping it. Um, one of my volunteers, he did two piles in 20 minutes, which is like insane to me. But I think by the end of it too, he was like, "Why am I so tired?" <laughs> so it can it can be fast, um, and yeah. So for me, probably I'd probably say 30 minutes if it's a full like, you know, three by three by three pile. Yeah, um, so would you like to ask your question for the prize? Well, first of all, the last question, which I think would be a great dovetail to what you do, Lauren, is I live in a subdivision with a regular sized yard. Um, how can I, oh, wait, is that it? Sorry, <laughs> I think I lost the question. Um, hang on a second, not it. How can, I compost in a discreet way if I don't have enough space, basically. And I think that's where you and your business comes in, right? <laughs> <laughs> you can burn a compost. So there's one. There, we, burn, we do three ways of compost. We do some sort of this. Not the perfect method that um, as, as perfect as Lauren does it. But now I will try to aim for that. But we do... Um, but we do a vermicompost, which a lot of you already do, vermicomposting. Uh, we do bokashi, which takes care of the citrus and the bones. And the, I don't know about the oil, though. I don't, I've never tried oil in my bokashi bin. And that's fermenting the method, uh, fermenting the, the compost, the, the food scraps. Rice, starches, mac and cheese will go in there. Um, and then there's this one, which I think, takes care of all, the majority of our compost, our food scraps. And this is why I think this is one of the best methods there is. But Lauren, if people are in small spaces or in apartments, for instance, how can they learn more about you? Yeah. Before you go to your prize question. Which oh, will sure. Off a prize. Well, let me go to my contact page um, <laughs> with all the things. So, um, like I said, the reason why we started it was because we were in a townhouse. I, I, I don't even know if we are allowed to compost or not, but I was just like, I don't want to be bothered to do the compost myself. So let me see if there's someone I can outsource this to. And then the irony now is that I'm composting for like 50 households, right? So anyway, um, yeah, I've seen that. I know that you're looking for inexpensive. The tumblers are like 500 a piece like it's a lot so um you know i know that higher composting is not ideal for most but um you know depending on your where you are your municipality might already offer um a drop-off location so like when i was forming food loop and, and trying to figure out this whole composting question and what the solution was um I was researching different municipalities in our area um, and several cities close to us, but not that close, have centralized drop-off locations where they will collect your food scraps and either they have a giant machine that can do it or, and it's, and it's usually free because it's, um, oh my gosh, what's the word? Ugh. Ugh, that word when like the government pays for stuff for you. Um, <laughs> anyway. Oh, it's like, uh, yes, it's uh, subsidized. Okay, subsidized. <laughs> <laughs> it's like subsidized by the county or the city. And so they'll either like process it um, themselves right there, or maybe they've hired another company that will pick up all the food scraps and, you know, take it otherwise. Subsidized, yes, I figured it out. Um, and so, um, so definitely check into your local government and see if there's already programs in place. Because like I said, aside from Virginia, there's a lot going on depending on where you are. Um, like in the Northeast, there might be a service like Food Loop. Um, that's already started. I know that doesn't answer your question on like how to compost in a small space, but like I think vermicomposting would be 
a good option. And <laughs> hot compost, I know, like I said, is not ideal for a lot of people. Yes. So Lauren's information is there. Um, check her out. Follow her on Instagram. If you're in the local in the Northern Virginia area, definitely uh, consider her <laughs> if you can't <laughs> compost everything that you have. And Lauren, what question, what is your quiz question? where you will be giving away a bucket of compost to local people and something else special to people abroad, people inter people outside of Northern Virginia. Yeah. Um, okay, so pop quiz, if you remember, um, what are the four components of composting? First one to type it gets oh, the prize. <gasps> the four oh. Carbon, yes. nitrogen, air, and moisture. Boom! Oh, oh, yes. so but everybody else, Lisa, wonderful, Liz, Liz, brown, green, air, water. Yep. Perfect. <laughs> brown, yes. Perfect, Julie, Sandy. All right, <laughs> Samantha, you were ready. <laughs> okay, Samantha, um, where are you from? <laughs> we hope you're in Northern Virginia. Yes, Loudon. Okay, okay so um, yes, email us, email us, and email the emails that you've been getting. Congrats, Samantha. Awesome. Yay. And we will get back to you and connect you with Lauren so we can get you that bucket of compost. Yes. Yay. <laughs> well, I will end here. Good night, everyone. We'll try to have the replay up tomorrow as soon as possible. And thanks so much, says Lisa. Thank you also everyone for wanting to compost and being on this call. Um, have a good night. Thank you, Lauren. You're Sleep welcome. tight. And everybody will, will, will um, just pray for Lauren as she goes into her third trimester and that she has a safe delivery and a wonderful baby that we will, <laughs> we will meet soon. Yes, you will. <laughs> Bye, Lauren. Bye. Thank, Thank you, so much, you everyone. Bye, everyone. <laughs>